Hello and a very warm welcome to all of our listeners on the webinar today. My name is Paul Hayward. I'm the Cloud Readiness Manager for Amir and I'm the host of the webinar as well. So thank you very much for taking the time out and joining us here. This is a very special masterclass because it's the first time in our history that we have a dedicated and focused masterclass series on cloud. And uh, personally, I'm very proud and very excited to be bringing this to you. Given that this is the first cloud masterclass, I really want to start with laying the foundations of what Citrix Cloud is. And really hence why we call this Citrix Cloud Masterclass 101. Um, part one, I should just add at the end of that as well. And yes, you guessed it correctly, we do indeed have a part two coming up. That's gonna be coming up in September, but we'll come a little bit more detail later on. So with this being the first masterclass for cloud, there's a lot to cover. And we expect this webinar to last around two hours in total. And who do we have joining us today um, on the webinar? Well, that was Patrick, as you just heard. So Patrick's my co-host here, and he's going to be um, talking in just a moment. We also have Jason Paul on the line, who you probably know from NetScaler or Networking um, masterclasses as well. Very soon, we're going to be catching up with Harsh Gupta. After after we speak with Harsh, we're going to be catching up with Joe Starcom and Robert Zawowski. I think that's the first time I've ever got Robert's name correct as well. Then we're going to be moving on and talking with Adam Lotz from our Sharefile team, followed by the lovely Robin Mankey Cassidy, who's going to be walking us through the Zen Mobile service. After Robin, we're going to be catching up with Manahar Singaretti, talking about our cloud networking services. Again, followed on by Blake Connell, who's going to be talking us through smart tools. Last and obviously not least, we have Jill Swarovski. Again, hoping I got your name there right, Jill, who's going to be talking to our customer success programs. And we have Joel Stocker and Alex Bacchanal. Um, in the background, helping with any questions that come through from us. Now, as always, and like any good masterclass, we have a fantastic giveaway for you today, and that being a Google Home. So if you're into um, the internet of things, this is one of those fabulous devices that can help you with all kinds of um, things that perhaps you want to take advantage of like nests or some of the other type of integration that uh, that are available so you do have to listen to the webinar because we're going to be asking you a question towards the end of the webinar um, that will allow you to win this prize so what does the agenda look like for today um, first of all we're just going to cover off what citrix cloud is then we're going to go through each retrospective service um, and speaking to all the guys I just mentioned a moment ago. We're gonna follow that up with the prize giveaway, and then we're gonna talk about the other masterclasses and specifically um, the next masterclass for cloud. Okay, so first of all, you know, what is Citrix Cloud? And, you know, really before we kind of dive straight into that, I want to just take a step back and say, well, actually, you know, what is the Citrix strategy when it comes to cloud? So, you know, for as long as I can remember, um, you know, the secure delivery of apps, desktops and data has been the priority for Citrix. And that's not changed. We've just shifted this notion to cloud first. And so think of this. Um, Citrix cloud is the Citrix strategy. And an easy way to think of Citrix Cloud is that it delivers the same capabilities as our on-premise products, but as a cloud-based service. Okay, so hopefully that's nice and clear to start off with. Now let's break this down a little bit more. So these are the main types of capabilities um, from Citrix Cloud, which basically supports what I just mentioned a moment, our mission to provide um, the secure delivery of apps, desktops, and data. So Citrix Cloud helps unite and integrate all of the Citrix technologies to deliver a unified administration and delivery experience. But 
how does this actually help you? Um, and what are some of the benefits of, of us doing it this way? So it's simple because with a SaaS model, you never have to upgrade again. The platform is evergreen. The UI is intuitive. There's less to learn. Services are cloud-based, so there's less to integrate. There's less to install and there's less to manage. And it's fast because all of the services are delivered in a published subscribe model, which is more elegant. And it's an intuitive approach to managing users and services. And ultimately, it's the fastest way to adopt technology. It's flexible because we support deployments of any services in any cloud or infrastructure, including the ability to manage multiple locations in parallel. Okay, so what this actually means is that you can take advantage of existing investments that you've made into your infrastructure and it's secure. You know, the key is that the apps, desktops and their corresponding data remain entirely under your control and either that being at your data center or in a cloud of your choice. So again, kind of breaking that down, kind of click down. What does that look like, you know, going into the product a little bit more? So first of all, I just wanted to say this isn't an inclusive list of all of this um, on the screen here. I just wanted to give you a flavor. So under virtual apps, we have uh, Zen app services. So this is the best way of deploying virtualized applications today. If you want to deploy or need or have a use case to, to deploy virtual desktops, then this is where our Zen desktop service comes into play. Again, with mobility, thinking about mobile device management, mobile application management, this is where our Zen mobile, uh, excuse me, our Zen mobile services come into play. When it comes to file sync and share, this is what our share file service delivers. And we secure that all through our NetScaler gateway services through networking. So Citrix Cloud is ultimately a platform which delivers a management plane spanning those multiple Citrix products that I was just talking through. So the core services are operated by us, Citrix, and that contains all of the management functions that you would ordinarily have to install and provision yourselves. So the value here is that we've already deployed and integrated all of our services in Citrix Cloud. Therefore, in many cases, all you need to do is subscribe, configure, and deploy them into your chosen workloads or environments, some of which I've just highlighted up on the screen here as an example. So this is where we extend at any device and any location to really kind of any public or private cloud as well. Okay, so Lots going on on this screen, quite a busy slide. The blue hexagons are the services in which we're gonna be covering today, except for Workspace IoT, Secure Browser, and Labs. Why are we not covering those? We just don't have enough time, unfortunately. So in future masterclasses, we will look to cover these services and you know, on top of that, because of our ever-growing platform, I really just wanted to kind of talk and give you a little bit of an idea with regards to um, our momentum that we've seen with our platform. Um, so some numbers that I just wanted to pick out between 2016 and 2017 is eight new services on the left-hand side there. Eight new services. That's a massive amount of new services available through the platform. On the right-hand side, 330,000 um, users through our license and usage insights platform. So just under half a million, and these numbers were taken from Synergy, which was back at the end of May. So I know that those figures have definitely gone up since then. 1.4 billion files managed by ShareFile, okay? Huge amounts of data being managed by our ShareFile service, okay? But don't just take our word for it. Um, we actually have some fantastic references available for you to, to go and have a look at right now that are publicly available. And I just want to show you um, how you can get to those. We're, you know, we're not going to be running through those today, but
But if you just go to citrix.com forward slash customers, you scroll to the bottom of the page, and this is where you can filter all of the different products that we have available. You can go to Citrix Cloud and have a look at the, uh, the customer success, success stories that we have available today. Now, as part of um, this webinar here, we wanted to give you a little bit of an overview as well um, of the interface for Citrix Cloud. It, it makes sense to only do that. So let's go forward and show you that. So at the top here, as you can see, the URL I have to log on to Citrix Cloud is citrix.cloud.com. I'm just gonna sign in. This is where we need some hold music, perhaps. Okay. And I'm just gonna choose my particular instance. I've got access to lots of different environments here, being a Citrix employee. You typically won't see that as a customer. Okay, so here we are. We've logged into Citrix Cloud. Just gonna scroll down a little bit for you. So at the bottom, these are the services that I haven't subscribed to. I've yet to go in and take them under, under my subscription, okay? But at the top here, as you can see, I've taken on a bunch of different services that I wanna use, okay? So app layering, secure browser, share file, et cetera, et cetera. We're not gonna run through those because that's why we have all, uh, everybody from the team who are gonna be talking through their retrospective services um, today. But just a little quick browse around, um, starting at the top here. So I've got some notifications that have come in straight away to tell me that I've got some particular issues in my environment. We have what's new with Citrix Cloud, and only yesterday we released a blog about one of the new features that's become available. At the top here as well, we have feedback and support. So if, for example, you need to open a ticket, and let's just say for argument's sake, you have a medium case, um, a medium severity, I should say. You can go and select your product and log a support case this way. You know, on that note, you absolutely can still do it through the normal methods, but again, we're trying to make this intuitive. We're trying to keep you in one place from somewhere, for example, and it's just about making it fluid. And then lastly, as always at Citrix, we want your feedback and suggestions. So you can go into here and speak about something, mention something that is relevant to you, to your business or your vertical that you would love to see within the product, okay? Right, okay, so that's my quick tour, okay? And I believe at this point here, Patrick, we are gonna do a poll. Yeah, that, so thanks, Paul, excellent. So um, just a couple other things, guys. Uh, this webinar we're expecting today to last something in the order of two hours. So that's not the exact figure. I think it said about one and a half hours in the invite, but just wanted to appraise you of, of that. So I've just got a quick poll question to get started with. Um, so I'll share the results back to, uh, back to all of you. Just want to get a sense, really, of uh, cloud services that your business is using today okay so are you using you know software as a service so things like salesforce etc infrastructure as a service so aws azure storage as a service so you know using uh, cloud uh, based storage um, uh, platform as a service so things like google app engine uh, would be uh, an instance of that or maybe you're just not using cloud service at the moment your organization is is not gone there just yet and you want to hold off. So um, I'll just leave the poll open for a few more seconds, give uh, enough of you uh, time to vote, and I'll just share back just so you can see what um, you know, your peers across the industry uh, are doing at the moment. Okay, so 50% of you have voted, so I think that's pretty good. I'm gonna close the poll and share the results with you. Okay, so there you go. Um, so it looks like most people are out there using uh the uh, the cloud already um so software as a service big at 50 percent plus infrastructure as a service as well um and uh, storage as a service um and about 16 percent of you so you're not using any cloud services at the moment maybe you're in a very highly regulated uh industry or or somewhere where that's precluded at the moment so so thanks uh, thanks for that i hope you found that uh, uh interesting Cool. So, Paul, um, who do we have up as our first presenter covering the, uh, the various services? Yep. So we have Harsh Gupta, who is our principal product manager.
Oscar, who's going to be walking you through the Zen app and the Zen desktop service. So okay. hopefully, Harsh, you're there, and hopefully we can pass the screen over to Harsh so as well. Screen over the background. Yep, absolutely. So it's over to you, Harsh. Thank you, guys. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Uh, it's not in presentation mode. Okay, give me just one second. How are you doing? Whilst well, Harsh is getting himself sorted out, there remember we've got the competition at the end, so you need to listen out to uh, you know what the presenters are saying because the answer will be hidden in there somewhere today for you to to possibly win that prize. Okay, Harsh, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for your time. Really appreciate you uh, coming in and then listening to us. Um, I'll quickly touch upon um, Zen App and Zen Desktop service. Before I get into the technicalities of the service, um, I wanted to talk about the key use cases, um, why customers have, have uh, started to look at Zen App and Zen Desktop service. Number one, the compelling event that we've seen is a Windows 10 migration. Customers want to move out of Windows 7, Windows 8 to a later platform. And as they're making the shift, they look at Citrix Cloud to be the ideal solution. Number two is contractors. Um, I think that just becomes a given for all the scale up, scale down capabilities and season, seasonality that really helps drive this, um, this move to Citrix Cloud. Um, the third one, um, as, as a lot of you responded in your poll, that you are using Azure and AWS. As, as customers go down that path, they really look at Citrix Cloud all the more seriously because now they have a hybrid deployment, some on-prem, some on the cloud. Um, and Citrix Cloud really provides you with the ability of managing both the on-prem resources as well as the cloud resources from one single location or console. Um, and finally, uh, PC refresh, there's no more a third and a third and a third of refreshing. Um, all of that just becomes easier. It becomes a cloud owner's responsibility as well as our responsibility, make sure everything is upgraded and is on the latest and greatest version. With that said, um, um, wanted to drill into technology. I'm using Azure as an example uh, for a lot of things. This could also be AWS. So in a traditional or um, let's say the on-premises world, uh, we would deploy everything within that particular setup. So if it's on-prem, you have everything at the bottom, your application and desktop servers, as well as your Active Directory and Netscaler. And what you have on the top is really that management overhead to give you that secure remote access. Uh, what we wanted to do, and as Paul was um, mentioning at the beginning, we wanted to simplify the delivery of the service, right? We want to give you secure remote access as a service. So what we did is we decoupled everything um, at the bottom. I, I mean, I left you with your core components and hosted everything on the top ourselves. So things like Studio Director, License Server, all the delivery controllers, as well as SQL Server is now hosted and managed by us. We own the responsibility of it. We make sure they're evergreen, so you're on the latest and greatest version, as well as we ensure that there is uptime to it. Um, we have a service level goal of 99.9% .9 for all end user launches. Further along, what we've also done is we've taken away Netscaler Gateway from you and we have made it a cloud service for you. I'm sure Manohar will cover this in greater depth as uh, later on in the day. Um, sorry. And then uh, what's at the bottom is really your workload. These are the things you really care for, your server workloads, your desktop workloads, your applications, and your Active Directory. One thing I really want to point out here is um, if you look at the picture here, uh, we have introduced a term called resource locations. This is where your workload set, your Active Directory set. And now with one single cloud service, you can not only be managing one, but multiple resource locations. And these could be sitting in different uh, setups. So one could be in an on-prem data center, the other one could be in Azure. Um, if you think about this, this looks like you're extending your network uh, to the cloud service. Uh, which in itself is expensive and has tight security concerns. Uh, that's where we've built our secret sauce in the Cloud Connector. Um, so touching Cloud Connector on how it works. So first of all, the Cloud Connector itself is a Windows installer that installs on a 2012 R2 machine or even and even 2016 now, which is joined to the domain. All traffic from 
the cloud so oh, from the connector communicates outbound over port 443 and it works behind any NAT and HTTP proxies. Um, and as, as we mentioned, we really want to drive simplicity and get you out of the business of upgrades. Yes, we've given you a component. Uh, we make sure we over the air upgrade it uh, without any disruption. And I'll tell you how we do that in a second. So this is how the, the connector is set up. Um, the real question is why did we build up the connector? Um, so the connector really performs four different services. First is identity. Um, as you think about um, a user and, and, and the resource you have to assign to it, as in when you do that, it is always a library. So we read your Active Directory, there's a username, we assign it to the particular desktop or application, and then we are out of it. It's a, it's a live read, we have read-only access for the most part, uh, unless the only catch is when, you, when you're doing provisioning. In case of provisioning, we do have to write computer names because the VMs have to be domain joined into your Active Directory. In that case, what we need is a service account, just like you, we need to, uh, today with the on-prem. The key thing about this provisioning is the technology that we're using is Machine Creation Services, MCS. Uh, and all we can do here is really power manage and clone your particular VM. So that's that's all we can do. Not We can at no point get inside the goals of the image. So your data is with you. The cloud service never has access to your data. The third service that is sitting within the proc or within the connector is the proxy service. As you did see in the previous uh, slide, we do host the uh, um, director. So all that information goes into or uh, goes from the proxy service into the director and the DDCs. And this service, at, even the hosted by us, all that data hosted by us, we have complete data isolation across customers and we avoid any data leakage. So we keep it really clean for our customers. And the final piece is authentication. Um, this is really for customers that are secure or sensitive. If you think about, um, if, if you do, do remember from the previous slide, we had uh, the storefront in the cloud as well. But for customers that do not want to have their credentials going into the cloud, what we've done is, if the customer is, is is willing to host the storefront and Netscaler in their resource location, right after the user feeds in his credentials, before the credentials go into the cloud, they're encrypted. And the private key is always left within the resource location or on-prem. And what goes to the cloud are encrypted credentials. The encrypted credentials get attached with the ICF file. And only once they come back at the VDAs does the decryption happen. Right. So, and that pretty much allows the user to get a single sign on into the service. So, so this was really at a high level what I did want to touch upon about the cloud service. Happy to take questions. Um, yeah, so hi, Ash. Thanks. Thanks for that. There's um, there's quite a few uh, detailed technical questions that have come into the uh, to the guys working in the background. A lot of those have been answered. One that's come up is just asking about um, uh, again, it's quite a technical question, but we're on a we're on a masterclass, so that's okay. About uh, PVS being part of the uh, Citrus Cloud, is an app service and Zen desktop service. So, is is that part of that service, or, or what is the case there? Yeah, so the it's a two side question. So, one uh, to have PVS to be a cloud service, um, it's been the biggest challenge because it is very tightly coupled to customers' um, actual workloads. And we were always away, we are keeping ourselves away from uh, accessing customer customer data. Um, and as I responded, we are working on a technology uh, of a cloud service where customers will get the benefit of PVS through our new provisioning technology. Uh, just in a quite a few early stages, probably in a quarter or two, we would be able to come in and answer that specific question as to how you could get PVS type uh, features from the cloud service. However, in the short term, um, if customers really want to manage their on-prem PVS through the cloud service, um, we do have PowerShell support for it. And um, if there, it's an entitlement question, I would say please reach out to your sales rep and they can help you uh, with um, using PVS on-prem. Okay, so thanks to everyone. I'll we'll let Daniel H to ask that question. Um, Stefanos E is asking about the geographical location of Citrix Cloud. Um, little, uh, he's got a few questions there about, you know, uh, complying with uh, European legislation and having 
uh, you know, their workloads running in within Europe. So what, what's the case there? Okay, great question. Um, um, so let's break this into two parts again. Uh, one is the control plane that the cloud service that we have today is hosted only in, in US, US East, while the pieces um, that the workloads actually sit where the customers want them to sit. Uh, from a performance side, we have customers across the globe who have deployed um, um, who have deployed Crucifix Cloud and are fine with the um, with the performance. However, when it comes to data sovereignty and as you're mentioning the US legislation, we are very soon uh, going to be deploying a control plane uh, or the, and the service within uh, within EU. Um, I would expect it to be not too far away where all the data would reside only within uh, within Europe. Okay, terrific. So th thanks, thanks, Harsh. That was fantastic. And there's a lot of questions that are coming in in the background. So uh, that was great. Everyone's asking questions. Please continue to do that through each of the presentations later on to uh, today. So um, I just want to make everyone aware of uh, an offer that we have. Um, it's uh, called the Zen App Service and Zen Desktop Service 100 User Starter Pack Promotion. So essentially, this is a great way to get started on uh, the Zen App and Zen Desktop Service that Harsh has just been talking about. It's a, a special price, 50% um, off SRP, and you can buy that over one or, or three years, uh, three year terms. Only 100 users available. Your normal discounts will apply on top of that um, as well. Great way to get started. So if you've got a project coming up where you think uh, maybe I want to start using the the, the uh, Zen App and Zen Desktop service, this might be a good way to get started and really start, you know, really use it in a production use it in a production environment. So I'm just going to run a quick poll question now. Um, if you're really interested in someone proactively contacting you so you can make use of um, this promotion. The 50% the, uh, discount brings you down to about $19,000. Um, so like I said, any discounts that you have normally apply on top of that, but that's the sum of money we're talking about. If you want to make use of that um, uh, uh, offer, then I'm gonna put up a poll and just please vote yes. If you vote yes, someone's gonna call you and you know give you the opportunity to, to buy that service. If you're not interested or not interested at the moment, then please vote no or don't vote at all. I just wanna make sure that there are people out there that really um, are interested in starting using this service um, are uh, uh, contacted uh, really quickly. So I just wanna bring this up. So if you want someone from Citrix to proactively call you because you're interested in making use of that, um, that starter pack offer, then please, uh, click the uh, the yes button. Uh, don't bother to click anything or just click no if you don't want to. Okay, terrific. So I'll just give it a few more seconds um, so a few more of you can vote. Um, so don't be surprised if you voted yes that someone's going to get on a, a call and uh, get you up and ready on the starter pack. Terrific. Well, I'm going to close it there. So last few seconds, if you want to vote yes, please click it now. I'm going to close the poll. Okay, terrific. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks for that. So Paul, we've got our next presenter lined up. Who, who's that uh, meant to be? Okay, so yes, we do indeed. Talk. So we have Joe Starcom and Robert Zawowski who are going to be covering off the app layering service. Okay, so, so who do I need to pass control to, Joe? Oh, hey, everyone, you can you can pass it to Rob, yeah. To Rob, okay, just one second, I'll find Rob now. Oh, there you are, got you Rob, sorry. Should be coming across to you now. Okay. And Rob, uh, yeah, let me know, I'll let you know once I see the screen. And Paul, great job getting Rob's name right. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did Excellent. better. Than, I did better there than I did uh, moving the screens on at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, thank you everyone for having uh, Rob and I join. Uh, we both came from the Unidesk side, uh, so we're happy to be here. Um, as many of you know, Unidesk was acquired by Citrix back in January of this year. We're new to the family. Uh, the announcement has clearly brought tons of applause within the Citrix customer and partner community, and. You know, we all couldn't be more excited to be part of this family moving forward. Uh, with that being said, 
all of UNIDESC's technical and support resources were retained, uh, along with our knowledgeable team of architects, uh, including Rob and about half a dozen others scattered across the U.S. Uh, I'd also like to point out that our amazing engineering teams were able to release the first newly branded app layering product, uh, version 4.1, back in early April of this year, and have since gone on to release version 4.2 earlier this month. So big shout out to all of our amazing engineers. So what is app layering? Uh, there's a lot in the name, but there's actually a lot more uh, to that. Um, you know, the app layering service is, in fact, the easiest way for IT to manage and update Windows apps and operating systems in their environment. We all start by taking a much different approach to layering, more so than any other vendor in the world. Not only are we layering the application, but also the underlying operating system as well. And this, this core technology really differentiates this market. So you're probably asking, what does app layering offer to the Citrix community? To start, simplicity. Uh, you no longer need a PhD in app virtualization or MSIs to package and deliver apps. Um, look, I'm in sales. If I can, uh, if I can layer an app, anyone can do it. It's just as easy as installing an app. It's, uh, it's really that simple. This leads right into app compatibility. Uh, not only can we handle these complex apps with real low-level device drivers and boot drivers, but we can also handle things like antivirus and even the incredibly complex uh, healthcare and hospital EMRs such as Epic, Cerner, McKesson, et cetera. The, uh, the app layering service also allows IT to be image content creation experts. Uh, by creating uh, these images and deploying them using whatever provisioning mechanisms they want to choose. Um, that includes MCS, PVS, but at the root of it, they're still only having to patch the OS and apps once. That is a drastic time saver. The elastic layering piece is our ability to deliver apps to users on demand at login based on where that user sits in Active Directory. Um, more or less, it's a hot ad, uh, hot ad functionality that's been, um, that folks have wanted in our, to have built into our technology for quite some time. Uh, last but not least is portability. It's kind of an odd term, but the idea here is that once an app is in a layer, it is portable across all major hypervisors. This includes vSphere, Zen Server, Hyper-V, Nutanix Acropolis, et cetera, as well as creating an easy path to the cloud for the organization. So now I'm actually going to pass things back to Rob, and he's going to walk everyone through a much more detailed look at app layering. Hi everyone, this is Rob Zalowski, a solution architect um, with Citrix in the app layering group. Uh, what I wanted to start with was really kind of just the basics. What is a layer? How do we take layers to make virtual machines? Um, so what a layer really is, is a capture of changes to the file system when you're doing packaging and changes to the registry encapsulated in a virtual disk. Right? You create a whole bunch of those layers and create a library. Um, What's one of the unique things about Citrix app layering is that we start with Windows and we create a layer for that. We then create all these application layers and we put them all together in a couple of different ways to create virtual machines. Um, to us, everything is a layer, right? So as Joe said, the operating system's a layer, applications become layers, a layer can include one app or many applications. And that gives us a big advantage because we're managing the entirety of the machine and we can therefore handle things like device drivers, kernel mode drivers, consoles, um, services, et cetera, all with the same technology um, to make it easier and simpler, as we said, to manage applications in your environment. Um, when you create that library and you have that set of layers, there are two ways that you can deliver those, right? You can include whichever layers you want in what's called a layered image. And that's something that we publish up into a provisioning system like PBS or MCS um, or Azure, a cloud system, et cetera. Uh, or you can deliver applications dynamically on user logon based on Active Directory group membership. Um, some applications, if they do have device drivers or early start services or dependencies where they have to be there when the machine boots, will have to go in that base image so that they can boot with the machine. Most applications, though, can be handled either way, either put them in the image or deliver them elastically. So what's the architecture behind what this looks like? Really, it's pretty simple. We, um, when you install 
application layering, you will go to Citrix Cloud and download what's called the Enterprise Layer Manager, which is a virtual appliance. That includes everything we need to do to manage applications from an app layering standpoint. So the database is included with that, the business logic, the UI for the interface is all in that appliance and you install that and use it. And you can install that on any one of a number of platforms, including um, Hyper-V and vSphere and Zen Server and Nutanix, et cetera. The other thing that you'll need for this environment to use the elastic share technology, elastic layering technology, uh, if you desire to use that, is a share to deliver those things from, or multiple shares. Chances are, for a production environment, that share will need to be highly available and high performance. Um, but that's what gives you the ability for us to, at login, mount text and have the users be able to use those dynamically based on who they are, and that. Dynamic ability to mount layers works both for Zen Desktop and Zen App. Right? So you can do it either session-based or user-based. And when it's session-based, different users on the same session host can have access to different applications because we filter those applications by their session ID. Right? Other things that you'll see in your environment if you are using PBS locally, um, we install an agent on the PBS server so that when we publish, we can publish it up into PBS. I'll show you a little bit in the demo what that looks like. And then we have things called connectors that let us connect to different systems. As Joe said, this technology can be multi-hypervising, multi-provisioning system. And the connectors have the intelligence to, for instance, push something into PBS or push it up as a VM into vSphere for MCS or what have you um, for that. Okay. As I said before, there's two deployment methods. You create your library, right? And then you create something called an image template. Um, that image template will define not only which layers are going to get published together as an image, but which system you're going to push them to. So um, you might decide, I have these 12 layers, and I'm going to push them into PBS to create a VDisk. Right? So your image template defines that. And when you publish that image, we actually push it up into the PBS store, add it into PBS, and you use it that way. Likewise, if you're pushing to MCS, it's a little different. We combine all the layers into to one image. We push that up into your hypervisor as a VM. It becomes the master image for the catalog in MCS. Right? Similar ways it worked if you were to use Azure or, or View Composer or AWS or some other system right, to, to do that. On the other side, we talked about elastic layers. That's a little simpler. We just push a VHD file to a share. And then the users, when they're logging in, their machine mounts that directly off the share. So that's outside of any hypervisor. That will work on any system and be universal right, for them to do that. That process happens through um, a Citrix guest layering service in the VM that actually ties into the login providers. And right before the user logs in, it enumerates which layers they're supposed to get from the share, and it maps to them. The neat thing about that is our appliance is not in that communication. So if the appliance were down for some reason, it does not affect at all which layers the users mount or knowing what they mount. There's some JSON files on the share that they read to know what to mount. So as long as the share is available, the VHDs are on there, that will all work. Okay. Lastly, if you think about this from a DR perspective, what's really nice about it is DR for all of your apps and your user layers and things become pretty simple. It's, it's pretty much similar to what you would get with a non-persistent pool in Zen Desktop. I just have to make sure that my desktop machines are available in two locations you know, by replicating them to the two locations. And then if I replicate that Elastic repository to the other location, it includes everything, including access permissions and assignments for the users to get their shares. Right? So as long as they log in in the other site, that share is available for them they will automatically map to their applications and get those in the DR site, just like they did in the production site. It makes DR very easy for that. Um, and it really doesn't matter, you know, if you're if you're using Azure as DR and you're using on-prem as your main, it's still the same thing. I replicate that Elastic repository up to Azure. I create my machines up in Azure, also running within the Zen infrastructure, and then I just fail people over to the Azure desktops. If I have a DR event, everything will be available for them up in Azure as they use that. Okay. So now I'm going to switch to a quick demo. I think we have a couple minutes left in our time slot. So the first thing I think Paul showed at the beginning, you can get into these technologies by going to your Citrix Cloud account. Then you can click here on app layering. 
if you haven't signed up for it, there'll be a try it. You can click try it and download it. And we actually have the downloads available here from that. So if you click into that technology, you can pick your appliance um, by clicking getting started and going and finding which hypervisor you want to use. And you can actually download the appliance right from here and install it. And then later on, after you have it installed, you can actually click on manage here and through the cloud connector, connect to your site if you want to use that, or you can go directly to your appliance locally on-prem to do that. Um, of course, if you're using Azure or AWS, it would be the same thing, it's just your on-prem, think of it as what happens in Azure. Looking at our appliance really quick, when you log in, what you'll see um, is that you'll have an images tab and a layers tab, which are the main two tabs that someone that's using the app layering product use, right? So where you normally start is you click on layers and the first thing you'll do is create an OS layer. And that's pretty easy. What you actually do is create a gold image in your hypervisor, um, patch it, install the app layering gold image tools, we call them. And then you import them into the app layering service just by saying create OS layer, running a wizard and pulling in that VM. We actually copy it into our appliance and now you can manage that OS as part of your app layering infrastructure. You then create something called a platform layer, and that's where you add the drivers for your provisioning system. So if you're using MCS, you'll create a platform layer, install the VDA, join the domain, save that. And then I can create what's called an image template for that, where I define the OS, that platform layer, and a connector to my hypervisor environment. And when you publish that image, we will actually publish a virtual machine for MCS up into vSphere um, that you use as the master image for your VM. So if you were to do that and then you looked in your vCenter environment, you would have a published image, which is the master image. You can open that and modify it if you want to, but you can also just use it and you make it the basis for your catalog. Or if you want to update, you know, you have one version, you made some changes to a layer, you publish it again, you then just rehome your MCS catalog to the image and it changes based on the new image. So it becomes super easy to keep different images if you need to deliver different applications to different people based on image. And then of course you can do those same things based on delivering applications elastically. And I'm pretty sure I'm at the end of my time and we're, we're up to the Q section. Yeah, thanks Joe, thanks Rob. That's the that's, that's fantastic. So a few questions come in. There's a, a specific one from Nick B around Office 365, and I'll let you answer that one in the background because I think it might be a little bit technical. Um, so if you can go to the question dialogue afterwards sure and, and answer that, that'd be great. Um, a couple more uh, general questions. Um, got Alex S asking, do I need to use the Zen app and Zen desktop service to get app layering? Um, we offer it both ways. So you can use the service. Um, if you want to use the cloud service for your Zen app and Zen desktop offerings, but you can also use app layering um, without using the service totally on-prem or in the cloud and on-prem, both ways. Okay, terrific. I've um, got a question here from uh, Yeva G, who's asking about, um, will this app layering technology make an app compatible with an operating system that it can't work on? Um, is that part of app layering or is that something else? It's something else. So yeah, with app layering, because we're just capturing the file system and the registry settings as they are in that OS, we actually tie it specifically to that OS layer that you created. If you need to separate it or isolate it, you know, you would probably want to use Appy to, to help with that or any number of another other virtualization products. Okay, terrific, in, in, including our own. So. <laughs> Terrific. Okay, sure, yeah, so there you, are can, some... you can absolutely publish it on Zen App and, and deliver it from Zen App. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. There are a few other questions that will come in the background, so if you could segue over to that, that would be fantastic. I know, guys, it's great to have you present. I know that um, our customers have been really excited with the, the acquisition we made a few months ago, so great to have you guys on board. So, Paul, who do we have up next? Okay, yeah, so we have Robin Mankey Cassidy joining us, who's gonna be talking us through the Zen Mobile service, okay? So this will be really exciting. I came from a mobility background myself in Citrix, um, and uh, you're gonna to get to see, you know, kind of how far we've come uh, with the platform over the last few years, and uh, Robin's gonna walk you through that. 
Good morning, guys. Did you want to? Good morning. Did you want to meet me a presenter here? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, just doing. That. I wasn't sure if you were a presenter already. <laughs> You've all been so. <laughs> That's okay. Holding on. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and hopefully we we see the screen. We did. You got your screen. Okay. Excellent. It was a great slide. I I just had to use it again. <laughs> Best, so, best things come in twos, right? It, it does. It really does. Well, thanks, everybody, for letting me come and talk to you today about the Zen Mobile service. I wanted to start by just reminding everybody what Zen Mobile is, um, what it composes, and, and how it fits into our broader Citrix story. So um, Zen Mobile is really made up of application management and device management. And then we have a host of great things in between. So we started off doing uh, device management with an acquisition we did about six years ago now. Um, and then we layered on top of it our own application management technology. So that came out of um, uh, conversations we had with ZenApp and Zen Desktop and being able to extend to the, the native applications that same level of security. So that's what our, our MDX technology is. Um, it's basically encapsulating and securing and adding policy to native applications. In addition to applications that you create yourself, we added our own productivity apps. So we have secure mail, secure web, um, secure notes, um, share file, and a host of other internal applications um, and some new ones coming out here in the near future um, for you to be able to secure productivity on these mobile devices. In addition to that, we added um, file and sync and sharing with um, ShareFile. So ShareFile extended being able to secure your data on these devices as well using our MDX technology. And then finally, um, we added a micro VPN. So um, I'm an ex IT admin myself, hated VPNs, um, hated to support them. Um, they're difficult for users to understand. Our micro VPN technology is unique in the industry in that a user doesn't actually have to start a VPN. Uh, they're able to just click on the application in the background. What the app does with the MDX technology is reaches out to the Netscaler, negotiates the, the con uh, con connectivity between the app and the Netscaler back into the enterprise. A user isn't prompted for user IDs and passwords. It's just magically done in the background for them. And it's not a full device VPN. It's an app to network VPN, which means only that app is able to communicate back into the data center. Again, a huge win for everybody. So this service has been um, made available in Citrix Cloud. So now you can take advantage of us running that infrastructure for you and you not having to manage that. So I wanted to just go through um, the architecture a little bit. Um, we've made some um, changes in our cloud architecture. Just to let you know, the on-prem product and the cloud product are exactly the same code base. Um, actually, we do um, sprints every three weeks. Luckily, our cloud users get updates every three weeks, which allows them to have the latest and greatest not only features and functionality, but if we find something that we need to address, we can address it much faster in our cloud service. And then that rolls up to on-prem every quarter. So you can see the advantage of being in the cloud. Plus, we manage all of the upgrades, um, so you don't have to do anything to, to be able to take advantage of that. So with that, um, we have created um, a regional networking partition. So it used to be that each um, customer had their own partition. Um, the reason this was done is because of IPsec tunneling back into their infrastructure for Active Directory access. Now that we've got um, the cloud connector, we don't need to create that IPsec connection any longer for that um, connectivity. So that enables us to do um, um, regional 
um, networking partitionings, which allows us to, to save on resources, but also makes it easier um, to manage and update. Um, it also enables us to configure load balancing services for multiple customers on the same NetScaler instances. Thus, we are able to gain more efficiencies, um, not only for us, but for you guys as well, um, and um, keeping them secure. So uh, just to, to back up a second, we've got the Zen Mobile service on the right-hand side here. Um, so we have the databases, we have the server itself, and we have the, the NetScaler. You can see that we're managing all of this. They're being used um, together, the NetScaler specifically. Um, each Zen Mobile is still its own standalone in, um, instance, but we are working on multi-tenancy um, to make this easier for not only us to manage, but also for our service providers um, who help out um, customers in, in their own environments. Then you've got the cloud connector that takes you back into the data center on the left-hand side. So that's for access to Active Directory for the, the Zen Mobile service. For the clients, uh, the communication goes to uh, the Zen Mobile server only to basically update them on um, the status of the device and things like that, or to push down new policies. But all the communication between the device and the backend resource goes through your NetScaler back to your exchange and other resources in your, in your environment. So the service, our service runs um, around the world. Uh, we currently run on Amazon uh, Web Services, but we are moving over to Azure Cloud. Um, so you'll see us doing that in the near future. Um, we uh, understand the compliance issues that um, specifically uh, you guys um, are highly regulated in many industries. So they do have um, those um, compliant data centers in the appropriate areas. Um, our staff is 24-7, uh, 365. So we're able to do around-the-clock monitoring of environments um, around the world. And we currently have 99.9% um, uptime, but we are just almost there to be uh, two nines and then moving on to three nines. So I wanted to talk about the offerings. Um, people ask us, well, what, what do I want um, in the mobility service? So some customers just want to start small. They want to just have device management because they have very clear use cases, but they also want an enterprise app store. If you're using Zen apps and desktop, as well as um, other mobile apps, um, having a single, um, pane of glass for all of your applications and services, including SaaS and web um, services, with one UI. So that all of our services, you can see across the top there, have that functionality. The standard service is just MDM, so it's basic device management. Uh, we support iOS, Android, Windows 10, Mac OS X, and uh, you'll see us extending out to some other interesting platforms in the near future. Um, the advanced service is for those people who want to get a little bit um, deeper web mobile app management. So you get device and app management, you get the micro VPN, and you get a subset of the, the mobile apps. So you get secure mail, secure web, task, quick edit, share connect, and scan direct. Um, so those are all supported for um, the advanced service. And then when you go to the premium service, we get you more of the higher end um, applications with secure forms and secure notes, um, as well as share file is included in this release. So that's a, it's a really nice tie between the apps and the data, which is basically what you need on, on the mobile devices. Hey, um, Robin, just a quick just a question on that last slide, actually. Sure. Um, if you go back, so the standard service advanced and premium, for those customers that perhaps are using Zen Mobile on-premise today, mm -hmm. um, are these equivalent to those um, to those offerings? So, for example, um, the standard service, is that equivalent um, to our, um, our MDM 
equivalent and advanced and enterprise. Is that correct? That is correct. That they are um, equally aligned. Yes. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Good question. Um, so um, finally, I, I just wanted to talk about some um, special transition pricing. So um, a lot of our customers are, are looking to get out of managing um, the servers and the, the Zen Mobile service itself. Um, so we are offering some really attractive transition pricing to move from your on-prem um, instance into our cloud services. So you can see it's there's quite a reduction in the price, especially if you go premium. Um, you can um, take advantage of this. Um, the minimum for uh, the Zen Server Cloud um, is 25. I mean, sorry, Zen Mobile Cloud service is 25 users. Um, it does require a, a minimum term of three years, but all the EA, um, ELA discounts do apply. So, you know, you can get even even bigger than this. Um, you have hybrid rights for 24 months. So that the hybrid rights means you can still be running your on-premise environment as you're transitioning to the cloud for up to 24 months. Um, and the prices are per user per month um, on, on the slide here. So please um, take advantage of that. If you'd like to set up a, a POC in the cloud just to see what Zen Mobile Service is like, how we manage it for you, um, how we can help you with that. And that's what I, I had today. I just wanted to give you guys a, a quick update on what Zen Mobile Service is, um, how you can access it and what the architecture looks like. So in the next one, we can, can deep dive into the UI and, and how it really plays in the background. Perfect, thank you, Robin. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Robin. So, just um, you know, one question uh, from me, really, just around the Zen Mobile service. You mentioned the transition minimum order quantity there, but what if a yeah. customer comes on net new? Is there any minimum quantity, minimum term? Um, the, the, 20, the twenty-five um, user is the minimum for any, whether you're transitioning or you're a brand new customer. Um, twenty-five is the minimum to to get in. Okay, terrific. And uh, Stephanos E has some uh, questions there in the background that you might want to check out. Um, okay. That, that are, uh, ask about hybrid deployments, whether that's possible or not. Um, but I've just got an eye on the time, and I think we need to get on to the to the next presenter. So if you could just answer those in the background, that would be terrific. I can okay. take care of that. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Robin. Thank you, Robin. Okay, cool. So who do we have um, next? Okay, so joining us next, we have Adam Lotz, who's going to be talking to us about the share file service. So, uh, Patrick, are you just going to pass that over there? Yeah. Okay. Over to you, Adam. You should have control. Yep. Hey, guys. How are you? Can you see my screen? Excellent. All right, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Adam Lotz. I'm on the ShareFile product management service. Uh, and if you've been using Citrix products for a while, you may recognize my name. I've been around Citrix for uh, a little more than 15 years now. So uh, uh, lots of experience with the different product lines. And I've worked on a number of our different technologies. And I'll say that being on the ShareFile team was pretty unique for me in that it was really one of the first Citrix cloud services. Um, so prior to that, we were largely an on-prem software company. But it's been a pretty big transition, and it's uh, fascinating the way that compares with traditional enterprise software. And uh, great to see the trends in the industry of, of everyone looking more and more to cloud, uh, but at the same time, uh, taking a very uh, cautious approach to the way that security plays out, the way that infrastructure plays out, and the way these services can blend in with existing technologies. So today I'm going to talk about ShareFile uh, in a general sense, but focus primarily on the infrastructure, architecture, and layout uh, from a cloud perspective. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail around the, uh, the tenants of ShareFile and, and how it works and the, the client set and all of that. Uh, generally speaking, you look at us as a, an enterprise file share and sync service, so all about accessing your data from different locations, from different devices, um, while giving a considerable attention to the IT management benefits of that around auditing, logging, uh, protecting that data, and storing it in the best way for your deployment and your users. Uh, so in this session, I'm going to focus mostly on the infrastructure and the integrations that we have with the rest of Citrix and talk about 
how that plays out uh, with your traditional data storage needs and what you've got in your enterprise today, or maybe what you had yesterday in your enterprise as you look at rolling it out to your users. So we talk about the share file data deployments. Uh, we have data stored all over the world. Um, and this is a, a bit of a surprise to some people that aren't familiar with our architecture. Uh, but ShareFile effectively has a hybrid design where the service itself runs in the cloud, uh, but our data storage can be either in Citrix managed services or in customer managed services, whether those are on-prem or customer managed cloud accounts. And that gives us a lot of flexibility in complying uh, with uh, you know, various uh, legal issues around the globe, uh, as well as um, some regulated industries and uh, being able to adequately respond to performance concerns that our customers may have. So it gives us a lot of um, a lot of variability in the way deployments work. I'm going to dig into a bit about the architecture of ShareFile and explain how that plays out. I'll say that certainly in our enterprise customer base, a lot of people have reservations and concerns about cloud data and what that means for them, what that means for their compliance, um, and, and how their users' data is stored. So we look at the architecture of ShareFile. You can see here on the left, I've got our clients mapped out. And that could be anything from the ShareFile website to our Outlook plugin or our sync tools on the various uh, native OS platforms. And then on the top, on the right side, we've got the ShareFile control planes. Um, so this is either ShareFile.com or ShareFile.eu. Uh, these are two entirely distinct services. So these are fully Citrix managed, and this is the application tier. Uh, so this is everything around the web app, around the way we handle authentication, authorization, this is all reporting all the data that we collect. Um, so that's really the brains of the ShareFile system. And again, that's something that we've got our own uh, security teams, our own ops teams, our own fully managed service up and running all the time. And this is a big benefit for IT and that it's something that we control and we manage and we take that burden off of you. Uh, so very similar to the model that we have with Fisher's Cloud overall, we're trying to take sort of the day-to-day -day mundane operations of running a service out of IT's hands and free you guys up to really roll out something to your users that's more meaningful, that provides value to them, rather than just monitoring a bunch of servers. Uh, now on the bottom of the screen here, we've got our storage system. Um, so that, as I said, can be either Citrix managed or customer managed, and we call those servers our storage zone controllers. Uh, so that's something that you can deploy on-prem, and you can store that data in objects uh, inside your enterprise. And there's a very clear split there in our architecture, uh, which allows us to, uh, to, to happily answer a lot of compliance concerns and gets us in some interesting discussions with your security teams. So the way this is mapped out, uh, when a client connects and they make that login request to the share control plane, um, it's going directly from that client uh, to the sharefile.com or sharefile EU systems. And as I said, those systems are independent, so we'd never have any cross-contamination of data from the US to the EU or vice versa. And that's for both performance and compliance reasons, but certainly a nod towards the compliance side for many of our customers in Europe. Now, once that user is authenticated, the control plane determines what their set of access rights are, and they'll report back those rights to the client, and they'll do things like folder enumeration, give you access to the data, let you know what's, what's in your account. But any time the file is actually being transferred, uh, that request goes directly uh, from the client to the storage zone controller. Uh, so as I said, that could live on-prem in your enterprise, that could live in a cloud system that you manage, or that could be Citrix managed storage. Um, but by having this clear split in our architecture, we've got a very where if you've chosen to manage the storage yourself, then Citrix has no knowledge of the contents of your files. Uh, and if you've chosen to manage that on-prem, we can extend that even further uh, with uh, tie-ins such as integrating with your existing DLT engines. So in this model, we can have a very, uh, a very distinct split between what data we have access to, what data you have access to, and where that information lives. And so great compromise for giving you a cloud service while still letting you maintain this, this right to that data on-prem, letting you keep it there and, and manage it. Now, of course, there are components that you have to manage, right? So the storage zone controller uh, is a, uh, an, an app that you have to keep up and running. And of course, we'd expect you to run that in a highly available scenario, um, but very lightweight compared to the rest of the service. And it's very low touch for IT. So it's the kind of service we expect you might upgrade, you know, maybe once or twice a year to keep it current with technologies. Uh, whereas on the share file side, we'll be updating the control plane uh, typically once or twice a month. And that's with new features, new functionality, security, uh, performance rollouts, things like that. So the benefits to us managing a control plane for you are dramatic, and it us constantly evolve that system to provide more functionality. And as I said, on the storage side, keeping that data on-prem gives you a lot more control over what goes on there, um, but we can manage that in a hybrid fashion as well. 
And when we look at our existing enterprise customers, uh, the conversation has changed dramatically over the last five years. Uh, so five years ago, the enterprise customer would come to us and say, well, I'm not really ready for the cloud. I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure how that affects my security model. And I'd say that over the last few years, every year, it's, it's 10 to 12 percent more customers come to us and say, you know what, I'm ready to talk about the cloud. Let's, let's look at it. Let's see how that fits in my enterprise data strategy. Uh, and when we look at our accounts today, about 60 percent of our enterprise customers are, are doing either on-prem or a blend of on-prem or cloud. And so that means 40 percent of them are actually pure cloud today. Um, and now our model supports both, and we absolutely are about storage choice and flexibility there. Uh, and in fact, having this architecture allows us to give you access to other resources uh, that exist not just in the cloud, but your existing data stores. Um, so by using this model, Sheriff can talk back to all these different sources, uh, whether they're in the cloud, whether they're on-prem, and we do that without disturbing the existing security model around those. Um, so using ShareFile and our storage and controller model, we have what we call connectors. Uh, and these connectors let us talk back to all these other uh, document repository systems, again, cloud-based or on-prem-based. Uh, and as I mentioned, we don't want to enable new, we don't want to disturb the uh, security controls, the access controls, everything else you are on these services, especially for things like on-prem data like network shares, uh, SharePoint libraries, or even exchange data that you've got in your enterprise. Uh, so instead, we embrace those existing security models. We impersonate the end user of those technologies, and we give users the ability to access those from a single location. Uh, so the biggest benefit here for the end user is ShareFile is a single pane of glass, a single access point to get back to all of that data, and it's really where your, your users to think about going to get to their storage. Um, so we don't talk about mass migrations of data into ShareFile. We talk about rolling ShareFile out alongside your existing data types and using ShareFile to extend the capabilities and the access methods users have to that data and give IT more control, more flexibility, and more visibility over what goes on with that. Uh, so we've got lots of customers that are using ShareFile to front end uh, both traditional on-prem storage system OneDrive uh, because with ShareFile, they have more control and more visibility into what's going on with that data. Uh, so a lot of options there for you, a lot of flexibility uh, in what happens. When we talk about tying ShareFile into the rest of Citrix, uh, certainly a, uh, a big push for us is our integration to Zen, apps and Zen Desktop world. Uh, so here we've developed a client we call the ShareFile Drive Mapper, and this is uh, effectively an on-demand sync tool that allows users to access all their ShareFile content from a managed system uh, without actually synchronizing the content down in real time. Uh, so by doing this, uh, the end user will access not just to their ShareFile content, but also other content in these connectors repositories. Um, and when the user actually navigates the tree, they're having a conversation back and forth with sharefile.com, uh, but the files aren't being brought down to that device until the user actually clicks on them. And then we stream it intelligently in real time with some clever caching behind that uh, so that you know, when I click on a large PowerPoint file, for instance, uh, PowerPoint's gonna request the first, uh, the first couple of megs of that file to get the process up and running to load the front page, and then we'll stream that behind the scenes as the, uh, as the document is loaded. Um, so for the end user, it's a seamless experience. It feels just like the, the document is there on their drive or on a network share, um, but it's all being protected by ShareFile and all the ShareFile access rights uh, are in place for that. Again, this is a fully managed client and it's something we've developed for Zen Apps and Desktop, so it's all policy controlled. Uh, but to my surprise, we actually have a lot of our enterprise customers rolling this out, not just to virtual desktops, but to physical machines as well. And the big benefits they see there are around the containerization of that data and their ability to control what goes on with it um, and, and to reduce their security footprint because it's such, it's such a small uh, footprint of actual data left on the device. And of course, we can clear that between logouts. It's encrypted in the cache and, uh, and very well protected overall. When we talk about our Citrix cloud integration, uh, the biggest benefits here for ShareFile around having that single management view of all your ShareFile services, as well as things like account provisioning uh, and shared configuration and authentication for the service itself. As we look forward to how we extend this integration, uh, we see a lot of opportunity with Citrix Cloud to really have uh, seamless integrations between our services. And there's a lot that we can do on the back end where, where just because as a Citrix Cloud admin, you've set up, let's say, a Zen app or Zen desktop environment and also a share file environment, we can share configurations back and forth and make joint rollout to that software that much faster. Uh, so I'm actually pretty excited about our place in Citrix Cloud today. And we're working on a lot of things on the back end uh, that will just work like magic for you as admins 
because we have so much insight and so much overview of how the different services are configured in your environment. Uh, so I think across the board, uh, you'll see these services constantly evolving and providing more and more simple tie-ins uh, that add a lot of value to you as admins. So we've got just a couple of minutes left here, and I'll leave this slide up, uh, but really I want to take this time to answer some user questions uh, and see what's going on there in, in the chat line and uh, cover anything else you've got. We've got about two or three minutes here to, to take a couple of uh, quick ones. Yeah, Adam, fantastic. Yeah, really great. I mean, I must admit that drive mapper, I use it within my virtual desktop, and it's really fantastic. It's liberated all of my files across my devices. I must uh, commend it to the house. It's actually fantastic. Um, so there are also several questions coming in more generally around Citrix Cloud and, and how do I get from my on-premise uh, implementations at the moment to, to a cloud delivery model. So just generally everyone out there, we've got a lot of what we call transition and trade up paths. So um, there's a promotion at the moment to help you get some value from your existing and to move to a cloud delivery model. So please reach out to your uh, Citrix salesperson and they'll let you know more about that, uh, about that, uh, those transition um, uh, offers. So uh, the one question that's um, um, coming here that I think uh, from Sam B uh, for you, uh, Adam, uh, it's quite a long and complicated question, but essentially I think what's, what's being asked is if I'm using Zen Mobile and Share File together, do they interact so when I sort of uh, authenticate onto Zen Mobile, I automatically get to my share file data? Yeah, we absolutely have integrations here between share file and Zen Mobile, and I can, uh, I can try to tackle that offline a bit in, in more detail. Uh, but the two products definitely work well together. And while I would never say that share file has to have Zen Mobile from a security standpoint, um, Zen Mobile certainly extends everything that you can do from a management perspective and gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, in terms of your user experience when you talk about uh, links in emails and uh, your containerization of the data on the device and, and absolutely helps protect you in a broader sense over the way a deployment would go. Okay, terrific. And that's it really. I mean, you must have explained everything perfectly. So thanks, Sam B, for that, that question. So Paul, um, who do we have up next? Okay, so we have Manohar Singaretti up next to talk to us about our cloud networking services. So, Manahar, are you there? Uh, yes, Paul. Okay, you should have control now, Manahar. Uh, let me know when you guys see my screen. So, briefly, but it's disappeared again. No, still don't see it. Uh, are you able to see my screen? No, no, still don't see your screen. And you're a little bit quiet as well. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let, let me take back uh, presenter. Oh, there, there you are. Got you. Perfect. OK. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is uh, Manohar, and uh, I work for the Netscaler product management team. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, we will be going through some of the networking services which are available on the Citrix cloud. So we will be primarily talking about two services, Netscaler Gateway Service and Netscaler, Netscaler Management and Analytics Service. Let us look into what is Netscaler Gateway Service. Uh, I think when Patrick took a uh, survey at the beginning of this particular uh, session, uh, we got a result of almost 55% of the customers are using some form of cloud, whether it is a software as a service, infrastructure, or platform as a service. This shows that most of the enterprises are moving to the cloud at a very rapid and consistent phase. And the primary reason for that are there are a lot of business benefits out of it. For example, you get elastic scalability, so you can reduce your infrastructure whenever you want, or you can increase it whenever you want, you will get on demand. You are going to pay, going to pay it on a consumption basis. Uh, it can be a pre-term pay or a post uh, post usage, but basically you pay only for whatever you consume. And of course, you get the least management overhead. Someone, some of the experts are taking care of your infrastructure. They'll make sure that your infrastructure is always uh, evergreen, and so on and so forth. Right. 
So as we see, right, apps and data are moving to the cloud. Now, if apps and data move to the cloud, what happens to the network? What happens to the secure access solutions that must be associated with these apps and data? Of course, technically, they also have to move to the cloud so that your users, whether they are in the corporate network, whether they are coming from remotely, or whether they are on the travel, they should be able to access these apps and data in a secure manner, right? I mean, today you, you might be deploying a lot of gate, different types of gateways. Uh, you might be using Netscaler gateway. You might be using some other uh, uh, forward proxy gateways, so on and so forth. But as long as, but most of this uh, infrastructure is in the on-prem. How do you make this secure access, this secure network be available as a cloud service? So let me introduce you to Netscaler Gateway Service, which is going, which is a secure remote access solution and offered as a true cloud service. Citrix Cloud customers who are adopting either a Zenapp or a Zenapp and Zen Desktop service today can subscribe to Netscaler Gateway Service and obtain a fully Citrix managed end-to-end -end secure ne network solution. This is completely Citrix managed, as I said. And customer has to just, with a single click of a button, be able to get the complete Netscaler Gateway service solution. So what benefits by using a Netscaler Gateway service? As I said, it's Citrix, it's Citrix managed. You will get an end-to-end -end secure solution. And this, it is very simple to use. In the next slide, I will show you how easy it is to configure. And obviously, you are going to get all the cloud service benefits like Elastic scalability, consumption based pricing, etc. So, let me take you through a simple one minute video. This is showing the experience of an administrator. As an administrator, I log into the Citrix cloud. Maybe I'm managing multiple accounts. So, I see the list of accounts which I manage and I just log into one of the accounts which I'm interested of. In this account, here I'm showing that I have a Zenapp Zen Desktop service already. So, I go into Zenapp Zen Desktop service go into the manage section and select the service delivery in the service delivery i have two options uh, i can either uh, basically uh, I can, if you see here there is a netscaler gateway component which is disabled by default so the administ the customer has to explicitly subscribe to the netscaler gateway service and once they subscribe they will be able to just enable this service using a simple checkbox and you can even enable session reliability and just save the settings. That's it. Once you do this, the entire Netscaler gateway solution for your Zenapp and Zen desktop service will be provisioned automatically. Let's move on to how the architecture looks like for Netscaler gateway service. Here, as I see, as, I, as you can see in the slides, Citrix Cloud at a high level constitutes of primarily two components. One is Zenapp Zen Desktop control plane, where you have all your Zenapp service or Zenapp Zen Desktop service, uh, which are managing your on-prem VDIs. And you will have a Netscaler gateway service component as well. The Netscaler gateway service component is the one which is actually handling the data path. That is, when a user clicks on an application, when the ICA connection gets established, that ICA connection goes via the Netscaler gateway service. For this reason, since it's in the data path, we, there is a requirement that this Netscaler gateway service should be available as close to the users as much as possible. So in the next slide, I'll show you how we are able to achieve that. But let's talk about the other components which are involved in the architecture. On the customer premises, uh, the premise can be a data center which the customer owns or it can be a public cloud as well. Right. In this, in this premises, we will install something called as Citrix Cloud Connector. This Cloud Connector, by the way, is required whether you use NGS or you do not use NGS. The primary purpose of Cloud Connector is for the administration of the VDI infrastructure as well as to perform the ICA proxy operation. Okay, so when a end user hits the Citrix Workspace URL, they land up on the Citrix Cloud Portal and when they try to launch an application or a desktop, the ICA connection goes via the Netscaler Gateway service pop. And we, uh, the Netscaler Gateway service will take the responsibility of creating a secure channel 
between the user and the gateway service pop and another channel between the gateway service pop and the connector and via the connector to the actual VDI. By doing this, there is a hidden benefit actually. The hidden benefit is that for the customer, the NetScaler gateway service is actually acting as the virtual perimeter. The customer need not expose any public facing IP addresses. All the, connect, all the connections from the cloud connector are, are, are always outbound. So technically, uh, we are kind of providing a sec, uh, secure perimeter or a secure virtual perimeter to the customer's premises and via which we will be handling the ICA connections as well. And since it's an outbound connection from the connector, there is no need of any extra firewall ports or any firewall bursting from the customer DMZ point of view. Let us see the NetScaler gateway service presence uh, uh, globally. So we have a total of 11 production pops or points of presence today for NetScaler gateway service. And by the end of this month, we are in the process of adding one more in the Singapore region as well. So together we will have a total of 12 global pops. What is the benefit of having such a wide vast network? Primarily, there are two major benefits. The first one is all these pops are always in sync with each other. The benefit of having an in sync pop network is that if one of the pop goes down because the entire network, went, uh, the infrastructure went down or we are doing some kind of maintenance activity, etc. The remaining 11 pops will take the load for this particular customer. So the customer will technically will not see any kind of downtime from a NetScaler gateway service point of view. So we will because of this we are able to provide very high levels of service level agreements also to our customers. The second benefit is that when a user for a, let's say let's say take a simple case right where there is a customer who has like say 500 users. The 500 users might be uh, located at one single location or some of the users might be roaming around the globe like say a sales team. Whenever a user kind of hits the Citrix cloud URL for launching an application that user request will land up in the closest NetScaler gateway service pop which is closest to that particular user location. So indirectly the customer got a GSLB kind of a service for their users and the users will be always going to the nearest pop so they will see the optimal comments on their ICA applications or desktops. So these are some of the benefits of having a very wide coverage in our global service pop. So to summarize the NetScaler gateway service, it, it is a fully Citrix managed solution. It provides end to end SSL security for your, uh, 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 for your application or data access to in order to install we will act as a virtual perimeter for the customer so that we are protecting their network as well. We have a very broad presence, totally 12 pops which are spread across all the geographies. And to configure itself, it's going to be a simple checkbox item. We will obviously provide evergreen updates. That means we will take care of making sure that the NetScaler service firmware or the infrastructure is always up to date with all the bugs and security fixes enrolled on a uh, by a uh, tri-weekly basis and obviously you'll get the benefits of elastic scalability. It means you can subscribe to gateway service for 100 users first to, to start with and after a few months you can increase it to 500 users whenever you want to reduce slightly you can reduce so on and so forth. So with that let me move to the next section which is NetScaler management analytics service. Uh, for this one, I will request one of my colleagues, Praveen, to talk through the slides. Praveen, are you available? Yeah. Hi, Manohar. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Praveen. So, please yeah. go ahead. Hello, everyone. Yeah, hello, everyone. Th thanks, Manohar, for that uh, quick uh, uh, overview of uh, NetScaler Gateway Service. So, uh, we just want to give you a quick uh, sneak preview, if you will, on uh, really a uh, brand new service that we are coming out with. We're very excited about this. This is called as NetScaler Management and Analytics Service. And this is actually slated to be uh, get pretty soon. So we're going to just give you a high level overview on this particular call. And uh, in a successive uh, you know, uh, setting, we will actually have more details and a much more deep dive on, 
on the service. But uh, really, at a very high level, what the NetScaler Management and Analytics Service does is enables you to manage uh, your NetScaler deployments, whether they are in the enterprise data center or they are essentially anywhere in the cloud. So it's really focused on ensuring that you can do hybrid cloud application delivery from a single point of uh, single pane of glass, and it actually allows you to be able to. Uh, ensure that your net scalers are managed from a single uh, from a single pane. Uh, and what another key component to this is all the analytics around application performance, application security, and being able to get all that in uh, from a centralized console. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, if you look at the core features and benefits. Uh, Really, as I said, NetScaler Management and Analytics Service is focused on enabling you to be able to uh, do everything in a hybrid environment. Uh, key to this is a guiding, guided workflow that we have out of the box for onboarding your NetScaler instances. And particularly, if you think about the NetScaler gateways that you may be having uh, uh, that some of uh, in, in, in the context of uh, on-premises, and as you may have a hybrid environment with NetScaler gateway service now, Really look at how you can simplify that overall deployment and management of the NetScaler gateways, and that's where the NetScaler management and analytics service really comes into play. Uh, we will have essentially the ability to provide application level details on how uh, your uh, core applications are performing from a health score perspective, from a performance perspective. And one uh, key area particularly is the ability to troubleshoot your HDX sessions and get uh, a lot of deep dive details about how your uh, users are launching desktops, what are they doing in terms of applications, and get a lot of security insight from this particular uh, service. We also have uh, the ability to visualize all this on a global infrastructure map. And as is the case with any other Citrix cloud, service, this service will be kept evergreen. So really the core benefit to you is it now allows you to focus on application delivery and enables you to free up the time that you may otherwise be spending on the management and the analytics infrastructure. <clears throat> we also have the ability to uh, have something called role-based access control that allows you to collaborate between your teams so that you can manage your deployments in a more collaborative cross-functional uh, aspect. And we will have a 30-day free trial once the service goes uh, generally available. So at that point in time, you can actually try out and uh, experience the service before making a purchase. And the final slide that we have essentially is just to kind of show you how it works, uh, go to the build out. But very, very simply, you know, this uh, we will have essentially something similar to a connector, what's called as a NetScaler, uh, and man management analytics agent that sits in your data center or in the public cloud, wherever your NetScalers may be deployed, and it forms a secure, trusted connection back to uh, the uh, management and analytics service in the cloud. And really, the idea is to be able to simplify the overall management of all the deployments. So there is a auto registration process that automatically goes through, and then once you have that trust established, you're on your way to managing your deployments. So uh, I want to stop here and you know, be happy to in the future uh, go into more details and provide you uh, other aspects of how the service works. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys, great, great description of those services. Obviously we've got several questions that have come in, so obviously networking and using networking in the cloud is, is testing a few people's minds here. So uh, a couple of questions for you. This is from Diego V, and he's talking about the NetScaler Gateway service. And is asking basically, uh, does it mean if, um, from a connectivity standpoint, if my receivers and my VDAs are all on, on uh, premise, does that mean, um, the connectivity between them goes through the cloud, or does it stay on the no local network? Uh, if the receiver is also inside the premises, there is a uh, basically it's kind of the user and the VDAs are inside the network. Then you can have a straight connection directly to your on-prem storefront and uh, directly to the on-prem uh, VDAs. Uh, this is the NetScaler gateway services will be primarily for users who are coming remotely into your data center. Okay, terrific. And a question here from James uh, G, 
is asking what authentication methods are supported with the Netscaler gateway service? Okay, so uh, as of today, we are tightly integrated with Citrix Cloud. So the authentication mechanisms which are available on Citrix Cloud are available on the Netscaler gateway service. Uh, as I saw in the earlier, some of the questions of uh, what are the, what is the plan for multi-factor authentication? So when as part of the multi-factor authentication, even Netscaler gateway will be contributing to providing some of the adaptive multi-factor authentication mechanisms what we have for the on-prem gateway today. Okay, and uh, final question before we move on is from uh, Ashish S. And essentially is saying, well, if I've got, you know, traditional on-premise uh, uh, deployments, so, you know, Zen Apple, Zen Desktop and PVS and everything, my VDI uh, instances all on-premise, can I still choose to use the Netscaler Gateway service? Uh, as of today, Netscaler Gateway service is available only for ZenApp and Zen Desktop cloud services. Uh, we are working to make it available even for an on-prem ZenApp Zen Desktop. Uh, by on-prem ZenApp Zen Desktop, I mean the customer is owning and manages the entire uh, storefront, DDCs, all the components. Only the gateway will be available as a cloud service. That is something which we are planning for the future. Okay, terrific. And thanks, guys, for those questions. So, um, right over to our next presenter, Paul. So, who do we have um, up next? Yes. Okay. So, waiting in the wings, we've got Blake Connell, who is going to be talking us through smart tools. So, Blake, are you there? I am here. Hey there, Blake. Okay. I think we're just passing over presenting rights to you. Okay. We can. Yeah, we can see your screen and we can hear you. All right, excellent. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, roll right into it. So this next section, we're going to be talking about Citrix Smart Tools. And just to take a, a quick breather here, I know we've been going through quite a few of uh, the components of Citrix Cloud. Obviously, the app layering, we just heard about the Netscaler components as well as Zen Mobile, et cetera. Um, I will say, with if you're brand new to Citrix Cloud, one of the nice things here in this section uh, with Citrix Smart Tools, is it's, a, it's it's a very easy way to get started with Citrix Cloud and adds instant value. Uh, so if you're you're new to this, this is a great way to get started. Uh, if you're an old hand and you're not familiar with Citrix uh, Smart Tools, hopefully this uh, will uh, give you some incentive to go ahead and and take a look at them. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and and get started. So what what are these smart tools? Well, if you look at the graphic on the right, you know, Citrix is all about the secure delivery of, of your apps and data, and of course, the three major product families there. And the idea with smart tools is to provide uh, some very easy to access and use and, and get up to speed with um, what we're calling, you know, microservices that really add value and help simplify, you know, the day-to-day -day operations and, and running of Citrix software. Uh, across the product families. Uh, so that's our, our goal with smart tools. Uh, today, we're, we're heavily focused on the Zen Apps and Desktop uh, software, but we do include Netscaler as well, and we'll be moving into uh, other components uh, uh, you know, as we go along in the future here. But in the, in the highlighted circles there, we have these four components of smart tools. Uh, so smart check, smart scale, smart build, and smart migrate. And again, these are all uh, designed to make it very easy to use uh, and to help Citrix admins do their daily job, essentially. The tools are also, uh, while they're delivered via Citrix Cloud, so they are a cloud service, so we deliver these tools to you, you know, as a service, uh, they can be used with both your on-premises as well as your uh, cloud deployments. So uh, that's a key thing to remember. Uh, today, I'm going to highlight really two of the components, Smart Check and Smart Scale. Um, before I do that, uh, one question that always comes up is, you know, how do I get these tools? How do I access these tools? You know, is there a fee for them? What's what's the deal with smart uh, the smart tools? And we've uh, I know this is a, a fairly uh, complicated uh, uh, screen here, but essentially you likely have entitlement to them today. So if you're a Citrix customer with any one of our perpetual license offerings and you have the new Citrix Customer Success Services Select Support offering, you're eligible to use Smart Build, Smart Migrate, Smart Check, 
And then if you're a Zen App, Zen Desktop Platinum customer, you can additionally use Smart Scale. So if you're a perpetual license customer and you're moving to our new software support uh, environment called Select, uh, you have entitlement to use these tools. And again, as a reminder, not necessarily for this call, but uh, very soon here, starting in July, the only uh, support offering that you'll be able to purchase from Citrix is the customer success services uh, offering. So select is, is really something you should be looking at. Additionally, if you're a Citrix Cloud customer and you have the Zen Apps and Desktop service uh, that Harsh was talking about, of course, you have access to all of these tools as well. And if you're one of our partners, whether a CSP partner or uh, another type of partner, you also have access to these tools. And then anyone can log in and use them to, um, to do proof of concepts and to, um, to take a look at the, the environment. So it's, it's uh, very easy to access these tools. And essentially, again, if you're a select customer, you'll have entitlement to them. Or if you're a Citrix customer, you have entitlement to them. So let's get into sort of what are they. Uh, so let's start with SmartCheck. So SmartCheck is, the, the notion here is to provide proactive uh, health checks for your Citrix environments, again, whether on-premises or in the cloud. So we've taken a bunch of different tools, diagnostic tools and troubleshooting tools that you may have used previously and tried to really aggregate them and consolidate them into a single, easy-to-use environment. And we, uh, uh, by the way, the Smart Tools team is also the folks that uh, bring you the Citrix Insight Services technology, the CIS technology. So we, we use that heavily on the back end and we provide and deliver this really compelling uh, front end to them. Uh, currently, SmartCheck works with ZenApp, Zen Desktop 7, 6, and beyond, uh, but we'll extend that. And we have these four different check sets, as we call them. So we check FMA services, uh, we check for hot fixes, we check LTSR compliance, we check to make sure there's uh, delivery groups are available. So there's this set of, of checks. And again, what I'm going to do in a moment is I'm going to actually go into the product and, and show you what these look like. Uh, but there's four current check sets, and of course, we're always uh, looking to perhaps develop uh, others going forward. So it's a really easy way to keep your environment healthy, up-to-date, current on the latest releases. Uh, and it does this proactively, so you're not having to do this, um, uh, you know, sort of remind yourself to go in and try to sort out where we are with, with different releases. This will go ahead and, and do this on a regular basis for you. Uh, so that's smart. Check Smart Scale is another component of the Smart Tools offering, and really what the idea is behind Smart Scale is to help reduce the cost of running uh, on public clouds by power management or turning on or off uh, underlying infrastructure in support of your deployment. So if you're on Azure or AWS, um, it's a great thing to to be running on a public cloud, but you want to make sure that when you're not utilizing the public cloud, you're not paying for it. And so this is a really easy way and a compelling way to turn on and off um, machines when they're not in use. Uh, so again, this supports both our traditional Zen Apps and Desktop perpetual license software, if you're simply deploying that onto a public cloud, or works with the Zen Apps and Desktop service. And again, I'll show you here in a minute how easy it is to configure the, the policies to do this. And it also provides some visualization um, pieces as well. So it's um, uh, really handy in that perspective. So with that, uh, Paul, I am going to go over and uh, jump right into Smart Tools. Uh, so this is Smart Tools, a live, you know, I've just simply logged in to smart.cloud.com. This is, again, one of our key components of Citrix Cloud. You can navigate to Smart Tools through Citrix Cloud as well. Um, you create your account, and then you simply log in uh, to Citrix, Citrix Cloud and navigate here. Um, and again, on the on the side here, you can see we have all the other services. We saw app layering earlier, Zen App Zen Desktop Service, uh, the Zen Mobile Service, uh, and others. So you can navigate to Smart Tools, or you can go right to it with smart.cloud.com. And we have uh, this really compelling and, and really intuitive, sort of easy to understand the four major components of smart tools are in these panels. Um, and I guess the first thing I'll do is I'll start with smart scale since we just spoke about that. So smart scaling, again, this is when you're running Zen apps and desktop uh, on a public cloud and you want to make sure that you're power managing the, the underlying infrastructure uh, to, to maximize uh, your spend there. Now, the first thing you need to do is to uh, ensure that smart scale can actually communicate with your site. So you 
you need to add a site and by doing that you add a, a an agent to your uh, controller and that's over a secure port so it's HTTPS and this controller then communicates with smart tools and you can see on my screen here I've added several sites but we'll go into um, to this site Zen apps and desktop 76 and the first thing that we get to on this site is is a view of um, how things are going. And again, this is just a, a demo environment I have. Uh, this is showing the last four hours. So if we go maybe to the last month, it might be a little more compelling. Um, and it'll show us that we've saved, you know, some some US dollars here by, again, turning on and off machines. It'll show us capacity utilization, the number of machines in the environment, how many are in maintenance mode, what kind of sessions are running. Um, how we're doing with our load index. So you get this visualization of, of what's happening, but the main event is really here in the configure portion. And this is where you configure where uh, or how your machines are, are turning on and turning off. So there's two types of capacity management that we support. One is schedule-based, uh, and that's fairly straightforward. If I create a new schedule, uh, you know, maybe it's the weekday schedule, and I can come in here and um, tell it how many machines we want. Uh, I can give it a time parameter. Maybe most of my uh, staff is, you know, in at 8 a.m. and leaves at uh, maybe 6 p.m. So you can create a schedule for the week, or you can create multiple schedules. So that's a fairly straight one uh, where it's turning on and off machines and, again, providing enough capacity to handle uh, that schedule. The other uh, type of capacity management is that's supported is load based scaling and we use a couple of different uh, metrics here one is session count and one is uh, load index and if you're not familiar with those you can get again through a quick little tool tip here it'll tell you what the what those metrics are and you can utilize those those actually are set up within Zen apps and desktop um, the load index in particular but you can schedule those uh, based on load. So as load changes, machines will power on and power off. In addition to that, you can create some buffers. So you can always have some extra spare capacity uh, because, again, it's it's difficult to get precise with exactly how many machines you may need or may not need. So you can create a buffer here. Um, and then you can also do where it's load-based um, uh, scaling as well as schedule-based, which is what most people tend to do. So it's very easy to set this up, and this is, again, where we calculate that savings on the first screen there. Uh, this is a cost in US dollars per hour for each in machine instance, and you can configure that based on, on kind of a rough estimate of savings. And it's really that simple. You, you, you set up your metrics here, or your um, scaling thresholds, and, and away you go. So being able to very easily you know control your machines this has real impact uh, and real benefit for folks who are running on, on public clouds so that one is pretty easy to uh to set up so that's smart scale uh the other thing i wanted to just touch on while i'm here is smart check and again very similar to smart scale you need to make sure that you're connected uh your site to smart tools so we do that through the agent again uh, we also have an auto discovery site if you've been using uh, some of our other tools like Scout um, and CIS previously. But I've got some sites I've already set up here. So if I go into the Zen App Zen Desktop 7.6 site that I have, I can go ahead and take a look at what's going on. And again, the idea behind Smart Check is we perform these four different check sets that are listed here. So site health checks, apps and desktop checks, update checks, LTSR checks. And you can do that. Uh, again, the main event here is configuring these to run on a schedule. So I can schedule each one of them separately uh, to run these, you know, however frequently I'd like to run them. And they run in the background. And what I get is this report, basically, that gives me an idea of what's going on with my environment. So I have delivery groups, controllers, machine catalogs. And if I click into one, I can actually see what's happening uh, in terms of um, the health of these systems. So I get several warnings and I have some um, some hot fixes that are available for me. So if I click on the hot fix update three for this delivery controller, it'll actually provide me more information here on the right side as to what this hot fix is. In fact, it links me directly to it. Uh, so if I want to deploy it, I can download and install right from um, right from this environment. So this is tailored and tuned for my 
you know, this particular site. So this is not just a display of every single possible uh, patch and fix that we have. It's tuned and optimized for your particular site. Uh, and again, it's it's the user experience is repelling uh, just because it's all right here, consolidated, and ever, all the information you need is is um, on this screen. So you can configure to run those checks through a schedule, or you can run them um, manually, and that's pretty easy to do. In addition, uh, in addition, when you run an LTSR check, a uh, little background noise there, but when you run an LTSR check, you can also come into the view reports section here, and the view report section will actually uh, provide the LTSR compliance uh, report that you can download and take a look at. So we've added um, reporting to Smart Check and Smart Scale, or to, excuse me, to Smart Check. So that's um, a quick run through on, on those two tools. The other thing I wanted to just highlight is with Smart Check, um, oh, and we're back to, uh, to Citrus Cloud. This is how you can access it. With Smart Check, you can, I'm going to tab over to my email, you can also set up notifications. So instead of having to log in to Citrix Cloud and go to Smart Tools and take a look at Smart Check to to see how things are going on your site, you can sign up for these uh, email notifications. And this is one from, from just this morning, again, for this, uh, this sort of demo site of ZenApps and Desktop. So in email, I get the notion, uh, or I get the notification, there's zero errors, two warnings, and then I do have a bunch of update checks that I can um, take a look at and I can view the report uh, within Smart. So again, very easy to use, and it, it really supports the concept of, of Smart Tools, which is, uh, the notion that we're trying to really make lives a little easier for our Citrix IT administrators. Um, again, very simple to use components. Uh, if we go back to um, to the environment, you'll see um, the four different panels. So you're very quick to access these. The idea is not to have to spend a lot of time uh, learning how to use these different components. Uh, and just to touch on Smart Build and Smart Migrate, Smart Build is a way to automate deployments. Uh, so it's a concept of blueprints and scripting. So if you have scripts that you have, you can you can assemble those together in blueprints and use them over and over again. And then Smart Migrate is the notion of uh, helping folks move from ZenApp Zen Desktop 6X or VDI in a box to current ZenApp Zen Desktop. And it really is about migrating uh, policies and, and um, helping that part of the migration. So these four major components uh, of Smart Check. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll just pop over here. So again, we're really just uh, in summary trying to help simplify day-to-day -day, day -day operations for our admins. And, and with Smart Check, the idea is to keep you current. And of course, we believe that that is a, a key enabler of, of security. Uh, and then on Smart Scale, helping to reduce, you know, spend on public clouds. It's really a, a must if you're running on a public cloud to be able to control your infrastructure. Um, and then the, the final point here, by all means, please take a look at the new Citrix Customer Success Services uh, support offering if you haven't. Uh, Smart Tools is part of Select, which is the, the base level package there. And I should also mention that, that the app layering stuff that we saw, which was incredible. That's also part of Select. And then there's a third uh, technology component that's part of Select, uh, which is the Windows Environment Management stuff, the WEM stuff. That's also part of Select. So there's lots of goodies in Select in addition to all of the uh, support that you get from, um, from the support folks. So with that, I think, uh, I think that's a wrap for me, Paul. Great. So yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Brilliant. I mean, I, I think the, the key takeaway for me on this is that with smart tools, probably if you're a customer sitting out there, you've probably got your license to, to use it. If you're on select, like Blake said, you, you, you need to go away and start looking at some of these tools. They're, they're really a great help in you know, managing your environments or standing up new environments. So a couple of questions for you, Blake, before we segue on to the next, uh, next speaker today. Um, and they're both from David W. Uh, first, he's asking, is a smart scale for both cloud-based as well as on-premise um, uh, implementations? It is, yeah. So smart scale works in both the Zen app, Zen desktop, you know, what I call perpetual license, you know, so your traditional license software, as well as the Zen app, Zen desktop service, which is part of Citrix Cloud. So okay. it works with both those environments. Okay. And, and in and fact, I should just add one more point to that. 
on the Zenabs cool. and Desktop service, you don't even need to download the agent, so it's agentless. Um, so that's even easier to to work with. Terrific. And, and the second question is around Smart Check, and he's asking, does that tie into uh, System Center Operations Manager for alerting? Uh, so today it ties into the CIS stuff, but um, going forward, we'll you'll see some further, um, but consolidation may not be the right word, but further interaction with some of the other tools uh, as well. So the idea is, is a common user experience and, and to sort of abstract some of the many tools that are available, you know, for the Citrix platform and, and a really smooth, easy to an accessible way to get to them. So you'll see more of that uh, as we go along here in the future. Like for example, the, the LTSR tool is, is relatively new. Uh, the LTSR addition in SmartCheck is relatively new. Um, we, we introduced SmartCheck back in the beginning of the year at our summit conference for partners. And we're just about six months into it. And um, again, you can see that we're continuing to add, add to it. Uh, and one other, one other comment just to, to finish off on SmartCheck. It is a really easy way, again, to get wet um, or to get started with Citrix Cloud. Uh, very easy to get onto tools in general, and then just start with Smart Check. Again, just just checking the health status of your systems. You don't have to do you know too much, and again, it's it's sort of this instant value that you you get, and it's a great way to get started if you if you haven't already. Okay, terrific. There's a question there from Shee Vess as well. If you can jump into the question panel and, and answer that, that'll be terrific. Guys, we're, we're getting close now to the, the finish of the webinar this afternoon. Um, if you're holding off the competition, that'll be coming very soon as well, so don't, don't rush away. Um, uh, so there is uh, an, another um, uh, presenter I'd like to pass you uh, across to. So I think that's Jill, isn't it, Paul? Yes, so we have Jill Sorotsky joining us, and um, Jill, Hopefully, in the background here, we're going to be passing control over to you. Um, and are you on the line, Jill? Yes, I am. Great. Thank you. And did I get your name right? Uh, Sawatsky. Jill Sawatsky. Yeah. So. I think I got it right <laughs> at one point. <laughs> yes. Right. Jill, over to you. Thank you. Sure. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. So. I lead the um, Cloud Adoption Services Customer Success Management Team. So as you venture into the Citrix Cloud, should you choose to do so, you may be wondering, will I have anyone available who will help me in my journey into the cloud? And the answer, fortunately, is yes. So that would be a customer success manager. Um, we realize that every customer has a different outcome that they want out of Citrix Cloud. You have different reasons for buying it, different reasons for using it. So what we do is to help make sure that you will reach that desired outcome. And the way that we do it is we have a um, standard kind of operating philosophy that we work through with you that I'm gonna go through in a second of, to, in order to get you to your specific desired outcome. And um, the way we do it is lead you through a series of success milestones. And um, this is included as part of the Citrix cloud service. So some of the things that our CSM will do for you is they'll work with you to create a success plan based on your specific the service offerings. And that plan is generally around how to roll out the service to your users. So we'll help you come up with that specific adoption and training plan. Um, the CSM will also tell you about some of the product features and integrations that will we'll be coming up. Um, they will uh, identify specific training needs. They'll see if, if you need admin training or you need end user training. Um, they'll make recommendations around that. And then um, they can tell you about best practices. What are other customers similar to you doing and how can you follow some of those same best practices? And then um, they'll look for additional use cases so that you can make sure that you are maximizing your value and getting your return on investment that you're looking for. And um, they will look at your usage and adoption and help you define ways that you can increase that adoption. So the advantages of this is that it will really help your transition to the cloud. They, they'll work to get you into the cloud faster, um, increase the user adoption, maximizing it, 
and making sure that your users have a really good experience with the product. So here are some of the, the specifics on how the program works. So we start in the onboarding phase and through um, why you bought the product, what your specific use cases are, build that success plan, and then develop a rollout schedule for you and a training plan. And then we go into the configuration stage. So just a note that the CSM is not going to be the person doing the technical configuration. They will work with whoever is going to do that configuration. So that might be Citrix um, services, or it might be a partner, or it might be something that you choose to do yourself. Any of those um, parties we can work with to, to get you configured and on board. And then once you're on board on the environment, then uh, the CSM will help you to work through adoption. So we'll execute the rollout plan that we started back in the onboarding phase, identifying champions, getting a pilot group together, working through the training plan, making sure that everyone is, is well trained on how to use it, and then um, raise awareness throughout your organization. And then from there, we go into what we call a nurture phase, where um, we look for additional ways that you can use the products or make sure that you are um, get using the best practices and that you're aware of new feature functions as they come out, we'll be informing you about those. And then if you'd like to be a customer advocate, we'd be happy to help you with that as well. So some of the key program milestones along the way are um, Starting with a, a welcome call when you come on board, then we help you build that success plan. We do a project kickoff and then um, work through the technical configuration and then an adoption, um, enabling the admin and then enabling the end users and then and making sure that you have a help desk set up for your users. And then after that, we'll work through uh, periodic success plan reviews where we'll be checking back. Are we meeting those original goals that you set when you bought the product? And then make you aware of also additional features and functions as they come out. So if you'd like more information on this service, um, feel free to email cloudadoption at citrix.com and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions, but I also am happy to, to take questions now as well. So hi, Jill Patrick here. So um, quick question for me with this. So how much does all of this cost? It is included with the service, no additional fee. Okay, terrific. And, and a very valid question here from Gareth C who I'm guessing is one of our partners on the on the line that's uh, uh, listening in. And he's asking how does the adoption services uh, sort of work with partners who are trying to help customers um, you know, move to a, a cloud-based implementation? Absolutely. We are happy to work with partners as well. We, um, we'll provide the same services to partners. And then if they need us, want us to work directly with end customers, we're happy to do that or work with the partners as applicable. So we really tailor this, our services, to what you need. Okay, terrific. Thanks. That's that's all the questions that uh, I have. So, Paul, who do we who do we have next? Well, Patrick, we yourself next. Uh, okay. You'll be pleased to know. Um, uh, so we're just going to speed this up a little bit here because we know that we've gone over time. Okay. So I was just going to show you this um, going through the web interface. But we'll just talk through it instead very quickly. So at the beginning of the presentation, I did a little demo and showed you how to log in to Citrix Cloud through um, citrix.cloud.com. Um, um, but in order to actually request access to Citrix Cloud, um, you, you can go to onboarding.cloud.com. And if you already have a citrix.com account, then you can use that or you will be challenged to create a new account, okay? So once you've done that, as you would expect, we ask you to verify your account. And then the advice really is, is to work with your aligned partner or your Citrix account manager or Citrix contact to make sure that we give you access to the particular service you've requested. The reason we say that is because we get thousands of requests to this platform on a daily basis and some of those uh, requests are not legitimate and some of those requests obviously are 
Um, so we just really need you to let us know and let the partner know that you're working with um, know um, when you've requested access and which service you've requested access to, just to help us along and make sure we get you to what you need as quickly as possible. A couple of other things that I just wanted to touch upon. We have some fantastic instructor-led training um, labs um, that are available through our education services. And uh, you're going to get this deck afterwards anyway, and there'll also be a follow-up email with a link um, specifically to, to this particular course. Um, so do check that out if it's something of interest, something that's relevant to you, relevant to your business. Um, the next masterclass is to watch out for. Jason's masterclass um, is going to be coming up on the 5th of July, which is uh, the networking masterclass. I've put the link in there for you. Chris from our team recently covered um, the latest masterclass for mobility. I've put the link in there to YouTube. And then we have the uh, next masterclass, which it's the same masterclass, but we're just doing it at different time zones, okay? So we've got one for um, Eastern United States, and we've got, got one here for Greenwich Mean Time over here in EMEA. So they're, they're the same masterclass, okay? One might work uh, particularly better for you. Um, put the links in there and then any other general in-person events and webinar events you can also get to through this link as well. So really, that's it. I just wanted to wrap this up and say thank you for listening. Um, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for obviously having a go on the prize draw. I know that's what you stayed on for ultimately. Um, thank you to all of the panelists and the staff who have been answering the questions in the background as well. Uh, look forward to catching you all on the next masterclass. Thank you.